To all participants that are here currently who will be starting shortly, um, my name is Michelle Atzo, but a very well welcome to all of you present this morning. Good morning and welcome to the One Health Youth Dialogue for the World Food Forum. My name is Mich Michelle Atzo, all the way from Ghana. I'd like to say a big thank you to the Tripartite Plus organizations, our speakers, our students, and our participants. Now, all living beings in the cycle of life, have and will continue to share one common survival need. We all breathe, we all drink, and we all eat to stay alive. The health of animals, people, plants, and the environment is interconnected. One Health is an integrated approach that recognizes this fundamental relationship and ensures that specialists in multiple sectors work together to tackle health threats to animals, humans, plants and the environment. We would like to acknowledge the WFF for providing its promotional infrastructure and its youth-led movement in expanding networks from influencers, celebrities, companies, academic institutions, non-profits, governments, media, and the public. Now, the WFF agenda and programs are designed to focus in and engage in youth groups and, and identify actionable solutions to address major challenges our food systems face. Now, for this reason, the FAO has brought together multidisciplinary sectors from the World Organization for Animal Health, the World Health Organization, and the United Nations Environment Program. Collectively, they are the tripartite plus organizations working for One Health. Now, this forum will consist of representatives from the FAO, spoken word artists, a 40-minute panel discussion with two panelists from health all the way to global health and hygiene. And finally, we will end the performance by Jovis Leonero on AM AMR on a song entitled, I Am Responsible. It's a pleasure to host the One Health Youth Dialogue for the FAO, which is one of its engagement activities. But also, that we, let me remind you that there's also going to be an art contest, which is open for submission up until the 20th of October, 2021. Again, my name is Michelle Atso. I'm a TV personality and a branding expert all the way from Ghana. But today I will be your, your host and your moderator for the next hour and a half. Now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please help me welcome a very strong advocate on the importance of food security, nutrition, and sustainable agriculture the Deputy Director General of the FAO, Ms. Maria Helena Semedo, to give us her opening remarks. Welcome, Maria. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, uh, dear students, future One Health generation, colleagues from FAO, Massimo, Kit, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants. I am really delighted to open this One Health Youth Dialogue happening as part of the World Food Forum and to welcome students and youth groups joining this event and this discussion and the World Food Forum I have been following with great interest and I would like to congratulate all of you for what you have brought as innovation, as, as energy to this World Food Forum. One Health, what, what is One Health? One Health recognized that the health of animals, people, plants, and environment is interconnected, is everywhere in our daily lives. When food is grown with polluted water, it puts the quality of our food at risk. When antibiotics are excessively used as growth promoters in livestock, Antibiotic-resistant microbes can be transmitted to people. As air pollution worsens, it can cause adverse health outcomes, including respiratory infections. The complexity of planetary health shows how the underlying causes of health threats are multifaceted with no one-size-fits-all solution. And for this reason, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations works with players from across all sectors to address 
today's health challenge with a One Health approach. We at FAO, we work very close with the World Organization for One Animal Health, the World Health Organization and the United Nations Environment Programme, spearheading and scaling up global One Health actions. We are collectively known as the Tripartite Plus organization working for One Health. But you are not experts on One Health. Let me tell you how we do this. We work with governments alongside many parts of society, like NGOs, the private sector, and civil society. For example, we support the surveillance of disease outbreaks, laboratory capacities, and help assess if development plans for the country compromise the health of people, animals, and environment, and always having this integrated approach. We also promote dialogue for action at all levels, helping countries join up together across the globe to ensure our global One Health. FAO is also a hub of technical knowledge, and we make sure that the vital information and data is widely shared and exchanged for critical decision and policy making. The Tripartite Plus organization are also developing a global plan of action for One Health. This is our blueprint for coordinated One Health action for the next five years and is done by the Tripartite under the leadership of FAO. You, uh, young uh, youth, you have a huge appetite for innovation and change to bring One Health advocacy to the next level. And this is why we are reaching out to you, the youth, as we believe you can help change the One Health narrative. And let me very frankly and honest with you. We have difficulties in convincing the policymakers what One Health means, why it's crucial, and why we need to abandon the old way on looking at health, having an integrated approach. And we really hope the One Health contest will bring new ideas and also how we, you can help us to spread out the message. Understanding and promoting a global One Health approach is key to unlocking solutions that can tackle today's big issues like climate change, biodiversity loss, and food insecurity. On top of today's One Health Youth Dialogue, FAO, as I mentioned, is also organizing a One Health Art Contest, inviting youth to share their vision of the One Health future we want in creative art, including poetry, music, or performance. The submitted art pieces will be used as our advocacy tool to show policymakers and One Health practitioners what your generation demands to change One Health system. So we really look forward to your participation in this contest as well, and we take it very serious, I can assure you. Dear young people, today your insights, ideas and suggestions will be our torch to light the way to building up a more inclusive and innovative One Health system. By combining the power of creativity and innovation with your audacity, we help to create a strong momentum to move the agenda forward for a healthy life for all. We are here to listen to you, your solution, and the One Health future of your dreams 
to make sure your voice are heard and resonated into real life policy. I hope that after this event, you will think in one health when you act, when you consume, when you are in contact with nature, when you, are, when you grow food and animals, when you travel, when you study, when you do your research, in conclusion, in your daily life. I wish you a fruitful discussion today and thank you for your active participation. Over to you, Michelle. Ms. Maria Helena Semedo, who's the Deputy Director General of the FAU, you couldn't have put this opening remark any better than that. The future of tomorrow lies in the hands of the youth of today. So it is very important that your input, your ideas, your creative concepts, your voice is, is part of this conversation because times have changed and you hold the key to a better, brighter future tomorrow. Now, in light, in, in light of that, let's take a look at a compilation of videos of what One Health means from a, a myriad of students from across Ghana, Tanzania, the UK, Nigeria, and Indonesia. Let's take a look. As a young person, one health means working together. One health means inclusiveness. One health means partnerships and coming together to achieve positive health outcomes. One health. One health combines several disciplines of human, animal, plant, and environmental sciences. These collaborative efforts address zoonotic diseases, climate change, food security, and public health concerns, which ensure better today and a more sustainable tomorrow. One health is when sectors, several sectors come together with a common goal of achieving optimum health. Hello everyone, my name is Dada and I'm from Nigeria. To me, One Health is a multidisciplinary approach to solving problems facing the health and the socioeconomic well-being of humans, animals and the environment. Over the years, professionals from different disciplines have tried from their own unilateral perspective to solve real-life problems in their communities, but this has yielded little results due to, in most cases, failure of these professionals to reckon with other factors from outside their domains affecting the problems they are trying to solve or the solutions they are trying to create. One Health is a way of engaging multiple stakeholders in creating effective and long-lasting solutions to problems facing the essential components of all communities, which are humans, animals, and the environment. One Health is a way of making everything better for everyone for longer. Thank you. Ms. Anda from Indonesia. To me, the concept of One Health is still poorly understood by the public and is rarely incorporated into government policy making processes. In fact, this concept represents a true paradigm shift and can give us a better understanding, anticipating, and managing the spread of a new pandemic. So, it becomes very crucial to promote the global health security agenda and involve many national and international organizations. Because addressing today's threats and tomorrow's problem cannot be achieved with yesterday's approach. We must design new adaptations, look to the future, and into multidisciplinary solutions to any unexpected challenges that might happen. One solution could be through education, which is an essential sector to raise awareness of one health among people, especially youth. My name is Janet George, a PhD student at Sokoin University of Agriculture, working on integrative uh, approach to health surveillance systems. And to me, One Health uh, means a lot, especially at a uh, personal level, uh, because first, when I started working as a researcher in Gorongoro ecosystem, I ex experienced the human wildlife uh, livestock uh, interaction. And that has really taught me the, that uh, One Health application uh, 
that uh, context is inevitable. But also uh, working in One Health Research has taught me the value of community, uh, how to engage community as a partner rather than uh, data sources for our research, especially in driving action. Um, it has brought me closer to community and I've been able to understand them better and work with them uh, in uh, various um, interventions. And lastly, as at professional level, uh, coming from economics uh, background, uh, uh, One Health has given me a space to collaborate with other disciplines and contribute my expertise uh, towards uh, global health security. So I have a strong conviction that um, through One Health, we can make uh, this world a better place. Thank you. Now that was a compilation of videos from students from across the world. And as you well saw, most of them have the same sentiments, the same spoken words, the same vision, the same interest in combining efforts, interconnected efforts in maintaining safety for food, in maintaining our health from our plants to our environments. We all should be able to have one voice and this is the time to do that. And so to continue in listening to what these students have to say and how they've interpreted their vision of the future, let's listen to a spoken word artist, Monica Kamara, on a poet on One Health. Let's take a look. Listen. There is a lot that I can say about creation, but let me start with a word. God was the first creator. He spoke and life was created. I believe that the same power lies in us humans. I speak and action follows. Whether my words inflict life or death is completely my choice. It all depends on how I treat myself and how I treat this world. Do I value the body that my spirit has chosen? Do I respect the land that was here before me? And if I'm eating, am I killing animals? We're all connected, working together as one. Animals need land, as humans need both. Remove one element and a cycle of life disrupts. Okay, have that in mind. Let me talk about health. Can you introduce yourself? My name is Monica Kamara. What is your vision about health? My vision about health is if we continue to live in an unhealthy environment, we cannot expect us to become or be healthy. If the land is not good, the animals are not good. We are consuming the land and the animals. Of course, we're not going to be good. So I do think that there is a lot of importance in making sure that not just we are good when we talk about health, not just our well-being, but also relating that well-being to nature, well-being to animals, as we're all part of the same cycle, and as we're all affecting each other without us even knowing it sometimes. Yeah, we're just part of the same health, basically. So I think that's what we need to be more aware of, how everything is in correlation with each other and how we can change or make things more healthy by starting with us educating ourselves about it, and then in that way, applying that to our surroundings and our environment and animals and people and whatever. So, yeah, that's kind of it. I, I was, I don't know about you, but I was engrossed in what she was saying because she said it with so much passion and so much 
um, realness, she, you know, her, her, her sense of authenticity just literally shined through. And she couldn't have described the, 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 the dire need and the urgency in getting our acts together. The interconnectivity between life from a plant, right, like you can see right behind me, to us, to our to, to the to the to the cleanliness of our air, to our animals, is all interconnected. It's all important. If we one, one action leads to the next, if we do not preserve our environment, we do not preserve and and respect our environment, it has a backlash effect on all of us. So to have a conversation on the matter of human health, animal health, and their environmental health as well, I'd like us to welcome our panelists for this morning. We have students from Uganda, from Kenya, from the UK and Indonesia. I'd like to first and foremost introduce my very first panelist, Eleanor Raj, who is who's graduated as a veterinary surgeon from the Royal Veterinary College and who worked for several years in a small clinical practice. She's currently joined us all the way from the UK. So good morning to you, Eleanor. Hello, nice to be here today. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'd like to also welcome Angela Nanibiro all the way from Kenya. Now, Angela is an undergraduate medical student from Mui University in Kenya. She's a mental health advocate. She's a global health enthusiast and a One Health champion. Now, I must mention that she's also an actress and she hopes to use her acting skills in community theatrical displays to drive the message about One Health in the future. Welcome to you, Angela. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to also welcome Zara Emanbukus, who recently graduated from the Royal Veterinary College as well. She currently is studying, um, she's in the School of, um, School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and she's researching animal feces management and the effect on health problems across different ecological zones. Zara, you're welcome to the One Health Youth Dialogue this morning. How are you today? I'm all right. How are you, Michelle? I am blessed. Nice to see you again. Likewise. And last but not the least, please help me welcome Permata Imani Imasintonga. I hope I got your name right. Who's recently graduated from a Master of Global Health from Duke University in May of this year. And she's obtained a bachelor's degree in epidemiology. Welcome Permata Sintonga. How are you today? Hi, I'm really good. Nice to see you. Awesome. Beautiful, broad smile. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Now, you've all seen before um, our, our open remarks, oh, sorry, after our open remarks by Miss Helena um, Semedo, who's Deputy, Gen Deputy Director General of the FAO. And shortly after that, we watched a video, a set of videos from across the world of students telling us about what the One Health agenda and their vision is. Now, I'd like us to dive straight into the conversation this morning. And to start the conversation, I'd like to invite Eleanor Raj. And um, the first question I have for you, Eleanor, you're studying animal health. And so what is the impact on animal health as we see it today um, on, on, on this conversation? What is, what is really happening in that sector? Um, I think actually a lot of the other students have really kind of um, already pinpointed quite well the interconnections as you've mentioned um, in terms of human animal and environmental health and I think particularly with the current uh, pandemic people are starting to realize that the way that we treat animals the way that we raise them for, for food and, and for other things really does have an impact in terms of our own health as, as people and the environment and the health of the environment as well so I think it really shows that we need to be respecting and um, respecting the environment and the way that we do things and really trying to be more sustainable in terms of sort of the, the way that we do things in terms of how long can we do them? Are we, are we being over exploitative? Are we sort of extracting too much? Or can we be more, more sustainable and um, try to do better disease surveillance and things like that? But as someone mentioned earlier, I think education is very important as well. And um, it's important we have a combination of sort of um, bottom-up approaches as well as top-down. So 
I think One Health really does combine all of those things really nicely to, to get really good effective collaboration and, and improve animal welfare at the same time. Eleanor, one question I wanted to find out from you was um, something must have triggered the interest on you know the the, the subject of animal health or being a veterinary um, student. If I cast your mind back to you know maybe your childhood, for instance, you know how do you see the change in the uh, respect for animals and the the the, 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 the the general subjects of animal preservation and respect, because my side of the world in Ghana, for instance, we don't really, I mean, the subjects of, of animal preservation, the subjects of animal, um, animal respect, and, and the, the, the mere subject itself is not something that is widely spoken about. From where you come from originally, is it something that has always been a top topic? Has it been something that people have always taken as a serious conversation? Or is this something that you just, naturally gravitated towards? Um, I think probably a little bit of both. Um, definitely, I would say in the UK, there's quite a strong sort of passion um, for, for animals in terms of pets and companion animals, whether that's dogs, cats, you know, rabbits, horses, things like that. Um, but I would definitely say in sort of more recent years with things like climate change and things sort of getting higher up the agenda that people are starting to think a bit more about where their food comes from. So animal welfare standards for um, the meat that people are eating or um, sustainably sourced fish, for example, and things like that. So I think it's definitely becoming a bigger, um, a bigger issue in terms of the food that we eat. But I would also say that with the pandemic, um, certainly here in the UK, people have really leaned on their pets and their companion animals to help get them through this period particularly lockdowns. And so I think the sort of human companion animal bond has really um, sort of come to the fore in a new way um, that people realise just how important they are for their mental health in particular. Now, in your view, what should be the scope of One Health? Because as it stands now, we are having conversations via webinar, we are having contests, we are having, um, um, you know, we are having policymakers making policies around the subject. But what do you think the scope of One Health should be? I think, as others have said, it's about keeping things very broad and very holistic and making sure that we don't get sort of tunnel vision. Um, I think one of the biggest things that is needed is, is really, um, as other students have already mentioned, the collaboration between different sectors, different stakeholders, and really having multidisciplinary teams where we have people with all different areas of expertise, different strengths, and importantly, you know, young people bringing their own sort of fresh perspectives and innovations to really hopefully drive things forward in a, in a positive way. So I think really sort of bringing all of these important ideas into action through those um, collaborations and, and multidisciplinary teams, I would say, is, is the most important thing. So more coordinated and cohesive um, approach to, to solving the problem is what you're saying? Yes. I have one last question for you, Eleanor. Um, how are women more exposed to health threats in the context of One Health, in your view? I think probably the um, the, the example that sort of uh, strikes me most from my sort of studies and things would be particularly when women go to do a fairly basic task in many countries like um, collecting water. Um, it's something that, as um, many students may already be aware, all the evidence suggests that that task of collecting water, whether it's for daily chores, whether it's for drinking, whether it's for livestock, it tends to fall disproportionately on women and girls um, due to kind of social and cultural norms. And I think there's a lot of evidence that that puts those, those women and girls at much higher risk of things like sexual assaults um, and, and things like that. So I think that's one obvious example. Um, but also even things like access to, um, to latrines, for example, that tends to affect women and girls much more because of inadequate um, menstrual hygiene and stigmatisation. So I think it's really important that all of those social aspects are considered um, when we try to deal with these, you know, these issues that are so interconnected. So, yeah, I think even just very 
simple things like you know water sanitation and hygiene really do affect women and girls quite disproportionately unfortunately this brings to light how serious the problem really is because it's not just a, a country problem it's a worldwide problem and we've been having these conversations for far too long now. In your view, what would be, as, as, as a young student you're know, studying um, animal health, what would you say would be the one solution that you would like to suggest today? I think really, um, as, as you're doing with this event really, sort of for, you know, bringing in fresh ideas and innovation through listening, um, listening to, to young people and youth, and particularly in like the scenario I just mentioned where people are needing to collect water and things. I think it's really important to involve and empower local communities. And um, because I think unfortunately so often, um, even with good intentions, people come in from sort of outside and almost sort of tell people what to do when actually the, the, the local people have a much better grasp of the situation. So I think involving and empowering those people is really crucial to help to solve those problems. Eleanor Raj, thank you so much for your contribution and thank you for staying with us this long. And I'll come right back to you after my conversation with Angela Nibiro. Angela, thank you so very much for being so patient with us. I would like to talk to you about the subject that you're currently studying in Moy, the university in Kenya, uh, and also touch on the subject of mental health and then come to how you can use your acting skills and your acting public figure position to change this narrative. So the first question that I have for you is quite simple. And the question is, when you become a practitioner, how would you mainstream One Health in the public health sector? Um, thank you for that question. First of all, we need to, I, uh, in my understanding is, uh, when we mainstream One Health in the public health sector, it will mean that we'll have a better response to infectious diseases. We'll come up with better preventive, preventive strategies for yes. diseases and we'll also be able to you know come up uh, as uh, people from various distance to better fast track and come up with better health outcomes so the only way we can mainstream one health in the public health sector is through collaboration you know involving people from policy makers to people in environment health and bring these experts into an open and beneficial partnership so that we can communicate, collaborate, and even co coordinate activities when it comes to public health. Because especially when it comes to, when in, in Africa, we, are, we deal with a lot of tropical diseases and neglected uh, diseases that require people from various disciplines to come together so that we can effectively come up with better health outcomes faster. So in, in, I'm not from Kenya, I'm from Ghana, and um, you know, we are in the West, you are in the East. Um, what would you say from your, from your, from your demographic um, you know, positioning right now, what, what have you seen change in the last sort of five years? I can speak about Ghana and how the weather patterns and the, you know, the, the entire seasons that we have here have changed. And so clearly the environmental health has been affected by uh, you know, our human interaction and our human disrespect for nature. So how have you noticed any kind of change or what have you noticed in the last five years in your, in your country in Kenya? What, have, what I have noticed first of all is the climate. Right now we're having uh, seasons that uh, not everyone can actually define the patterns. Like uh, currently we're supposed to be having a dry and hot type of season, but we're having, we're having a, a cold and a short rainy season, which uh, we can explain as a community because of the deforestation and yes. also the invasion of people into the wildlife uh, environment. And also we've noticed that uh, there are some types, of, there are some breeds of animals that, or there are some species of animals that are actually thriving in this current climate and there are some other uh, animals that are not thriving and they're, they're dying or they're not healthy enough. So there has been a lot of changes also when it comes to the types of zoonotic diseases that are currently prevalent. 
compared to five years ago. So probably we can blame it on we can blame it on climate change. We can blame it on deforestation. We can blame it on industrialization also. And uh, yeah, that's what I've noticed in East Africa. You are an actress in your country, Kenya, and you you have previously used your acting skills to um, to sensitize and, and create awareness around subjects. Do you feel that this is the best way to um, involve, engage, and also retain an, an audience attention when it comes to disseminating information that is quite pertinent and quite pressing to relay? Do you feel that acting or the form of enactment, theatrical enactments, are the best ways to get people to see how real and how pertinent the issue is? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I believe acting is the best way to relay information, especially for young people, because uh, around, let's say, almost everyone around the world is connected to a phone. Everyone is always uh, on Instagram or on TikTok or on YouTube trying to get some form of entertainment. And if we can't get them to to get these concepts through maybe webinars or having physical meetings, then why not join them and get into these platforms and, and relay this information about One Health. So it will be the best way to reach the young, young uh, population so that they can slowly embrace this idea so that they can understand the vision that we have for One Health. And eventually you get that uh, it's like a slow psychological uh, conditioning that uh, like and after two... Yeah. Yeah, like after two or three years, you get that everyone is normalizing the concept of One Health. And if they go, if they go to work somewhere or they're seeing a public health uh, intervention, you see them tweeting them, be like, why are we not doing it in our One Health approach? Why are we not involving policymakers? Why are we not involving doctors? Why are we not involving environmentalists in actually uh, handling this public health crisis? So, yeah, that's my, those are my thoughts. I think we should... Uh, incorporate entertainment, acting, poetry, even music to actually condition the general population towards one health, the One Health approach. And possibly a, a dance challenge that may, may trend on social media um, before we have another um, cyber crash that happened yesterday across the world. Possibly if we had a challenge of some sort, um, do you think that that would get people more engaged and more interested in, in probably just, you know, dancing to the beat? Okay, uh, <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, I think so. We, when if we if we came up with a like a one health challenge, or we we can use memes. By the way, we can use memes around one health. And uh, yesterday, I saw the WHO used a very smart uh, strategy where they uh, they there is a phrase where they say the uh, the WhatsApp can be down. Facebook can be down, but don't push your mask down. So you get that they received a lot of traffic on their post because they actually related to what's happening. And it was, they incorporated a form of a, it looked like a meme, but then again, it was, they were actually passing a very, very valid information. And, and I think we should also adopt such, uh, such strategies so that we can reach the wider population. I totally agree with you that probably leveraging on yesterday's, um, you know, shutdown across the world where everyone's social media feeds were interrupted by the cyber freeze, uh, possibly sort of piggyback off that trend, trending subjects, and possibly have the WHO and all other policymakers, the Tripartite Plus organizations, and probably use this as an opportunity to, um, to run a campaign now whilst, you know, to, to strike the, the, the iron whilst it's hot, literally. Um, Angela, thank you so very much for your contributions and thank you for um, coming to us all the way from Kenya. Thank you. Okay, so right now I'd like to invite Zara Imambukus, who's recently graduated from the Royal Veterinary College with a Bachelor's in Veterinary Science undertaking Masters in One Health. You're currently also studying animal feces management and the effect on health problems across different ecological zones. That's quite an interesting subject, Zara. Can you expand on that for us? <laughs> Um, yeah, actually, I'm doing some research in Ghana at the minute. Yeah, and I'm comparing 
the northern region of, I think it's Savalugu, by the eastern, southeastern region of Sikari East and how animal feces within both those regions can be indicators for health problems like child stunting because of E. coli and water sources. And I'm comparing how in different agroecological zones, the disease prevalence could very well be different because of the transmission between those two items. So very, very interesting. So, would this have been your first African country, um, that being Ghana, the northern part of Ghana? Would this have been your very first African country? And if not, which other African country have you visited? Um, this is my first, I think, real research field, okay. so yes. The only other African country that I have visited is Mauritius, only because my parents are from there. Well, they say that Ghana is the center of the world, so welcome to Ghana, and I'm glad that you know you are, you are yeah, you're doing your research here. Possibly, we will be able to give you a bit more findings to be able to give you a springboard for the other countries as well. Now, Zara, I have a couple of questions I'd like to ask in respect to what it is that you envision um, the One Health, you know, conversation that we're having today, and how you feel things should change. In your view, what advice do you have for international policymakers? Um, and, and, and what do you think they should do different in promoting One Health? See, I think firstly, the problem that I've come across as a young person is that the concept of One Health isn't widely known to someone who's not in the field. Yes. So and having someone understand that is quite simple, but depending on the context of the situation. It's easy to explain a pandemic to someone and yes. then from that relate it to One Health. But when I say, when I tell people, oh, I, I study One Health or I'm part of this One Health team, I think everyone turns around to myself and looks quite puzzled. And it's like, yeah. what's, what's that? And I think using examples that young people would understand, for example, AMR is something they would understand, but they wouldn't know that it's AMR because that no one's ever explained what AMR is to them. So that would be the first thing. And I think another thing would be making policymakers more known to the public. I don't know who my policymakers are in the UK. I would love to know and be able to, I don't know, write them letters or have some sort of yes, put a face on Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Because, and I don't want to out anyone and be like, you're not doing your job, but it's easy to make suggestions, but then perspective is everything. Is that realistic? Is that feasible? And having direct conversations with them like, like humans instead of, oh, a chain reaction. I, I, I feel that the word policymaker has been overrated because we, we haven't humanized that label. Um, we, you know, it's, it's almost as though it's, it's, it's just uh, someone sitting at the top of a mountain initially, that, you know, giving, giving you know, directives and, and giving guidelines and giving rules and conditions. So are you saying that unveiling these policymakers to the world um, or rather to students through conversations through you know one-on-one -on -one or through seminars will probably remove the veil and take away the filter so to say of um, just the name and not you know and, and, and creating a human interaction a human connection is that what you're saying absolutely that's exactly what i'm saying i think in this co well post-covid world we're very used to online interactions and being behind the screen or being behind the mask, as someone put it. Um, but it'd be more important to resonate with someone and to be able to actually have that conversation and then for, for them to turn around to you essentially and say, you know, that's a great idea. However, it's not feasible because of this, this and that factor. And then move forward. To ask the same 
same question to the rest of my panelists and see what your view is about this suggestion that Zara is making, which is, you know, unveiling the names, unveiling the titles and removing the labels and humanizing the, the policy makers, so to say. So Angela, what is your view about, you know, having conversations, direct conversations with policy makers and not just the names and the labels that they carry? What's your view on that? I think it will, it's uh, if we humanize the policymakers, uh, as young people especially, we'll be comfortable to actually share our ideas. We'll be yeah. comfortable not to uh, to stick to us to a certain script when yeah. it comes to us telling them what is the way forward when it comes to one health. And uh, by the end of the day, I think it will uh, it will mean that we'll come up with better more creative ideas and uh, you know you feel like you're being you're being mentored and for them to also feel comfortable by actually uh, guiding you on what is possible what's not possible and how how you can work with other partners now one thing that zara mentioned which struck struck a chord um to me, especially because you know, when I, when, when I was doing research on the One Health um, conversation that we're having today, um, I hadn't heard of One Health, and quite frankly, One Health is is such a, a, a is such a a subject that we all face from everything that we do in life, from the moment we wake up by taking that first breath, from the food that we eat, from you know the animals that you know our pets that are within our house, and I've got dogs that run around like crazy in my compound, which I'm sure you must have heard. Um, so, so I'm an animal lover, um, but but I never actually sort of heard the whole word one health up until a few weeks ago. So why is it that the 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 the, the, the subject or the the, the subject to One Health is something that hasn't kind of permeated through conversations just like the pandemic has. Why do you think that's so? I have this to you. Um, I think uh, the word One Health hasn't really permeated to the general population because, uh, first of all, um, let me be honest, you, yeah. for you to actually yeah. know <laughs> for you to actually know what One Health is, you have to know someone who knows someone who knows someone who actually know, knows what, what One Health is. And it sounds like a foreign concept, the same way we use the antimicrobial resistant term to the general population. And I think we need to break down One yes. Health to different, co to, we need to individualize the definition of One Health to different communities. You know, One Health might mean something different depend in the Kenyan context. One health might um, it might mean something different in the Europe in, in the European context. So we need to relate the definition of one health to what people are experiencing in their daily lives uh, in terms of the environment uh, because you you need to accept that my environs in Kenya are not the same as, as uh, Eleanor's environs, maybe in the UK or Indonesia. So if we can individualize One Health in each country and come up with strategies to educate our own communities, then we might be able to, everyone might be able to understand this concept. Thank you so very much. I know that Permata Sintonga has been waiting for a while now, and I, I can't wait to have this conversation with you. Um, but I, I, I wanted to ask, I, I want us to go off script a little bit, quite frankly, and, and, and have a conversation, you know, from, from, a, from, from a human standpoint. I think that sometimes, you know, we, we tend to just follow the script, and I wanted, like, like Angela said, you know, let's, let me be honest with you, you know, the, the conversation has to be a real conversation. The conversation has to be without, you know, um, inscriptions and terminologies and all the big fancy words. It just has to have a real day-to-day -day conversation that we're having today. Now, so the question I wanted to ask, the very first question I wanted to ask you, Kamata, is did you ever hear of the term One Health? And if you did, what did it mean to you? Okay, so uh, thank you for the questions. I think 
because I came from like a bachelor degree of public health. At the beginning is the first time I heard the terms of One Health. And fortunately in my campus in Indonesia, we have like One Health University networks. So there's a lot of event about One Health in my university. And I think what the meaning of One Health is like, I'm actually I'm really amazed when I know this term because like, I think it's one, the only one terms uh, who mentioned about intercollaborative multidisciplines. Like, do you imagine like in Indonesia, like when you talk health, like you just you just like thinking about the doctors, never yes. thinking about yeah, never thinking about veterinarians or even like people who work in the agricultures. So uh-huh. like having a one health, it's introduced about as a human who work in the health industries, we need not only focus about the health itself, but also need to think out of the our zone about the animals and also about uh, the agriculture itself. And I think uh, as a students, I really amazed about these terms at the beginning, but I just knew it when I was in the university as a public health student, yeah. You know, you said something that, again, I, I use the word struck a nerve because it's all about, you know, how we are evoking, how we need to evoke emotion to get a reaction. Um, I'm going to go back to what happened to all of us across the world. I mean, here in Ghana, you know, for a good six hours, we were completely disconnected from the world, from all social media platforms. And quite frankly, it felt quite peaceful. I said to a friend of mine that it feels almost as though people are not talking in thought bubbles and texting so the airwaves are completely free of devices but one thing that it did do was that it created a common global conversation so this common global conversation that happened yesterday for six hours where everyone from across the world from clubhouse to telegram clearly because social media platforms from facebook and instagram and um what's up or down we're having conversations on how it was disrupting, obviously, the economy, disrupting um, the marketplaces, and all sorts of conversations were happening. But it was all around and centered around the fact that communication came to a standstill. Do you feel that if we had this form of um, shakeup? And this form of, you know, radical shift where everything comes to a standstill, people will realize how really important it is because people are not taking it seriously that climate change is affecting every single living being on the planet. And it all stems from our input and our, our, you know, our discipline towards and respect towards the environment. Do you feel that if we had this kind of radical shakeup, um, it will get people to stop and change. And if so, what should we do? Yeah, I think it's kind of the important things like to make people aware they, they need this, make them aware like uh, you need to care about this because when we just give the awareness or just the education without make a people aware that it's urgent if they do not know like I think like one of the shocking moments about One Health happened in Indonesia is uh, I think like most part of the world is avian flu. Like it's really, really like quite uh, like dramatic situations when like everyone usually most of the time we eat chicken and suddenly yeah. we could not eat chicken and it's something like really, really like a uh, therapeutic shock for our societies and from that point like we just more aware about when before we need uh, before we eat something we need sh- should aware what something we eat like sample we need to ensure like they have a certificate or some things or we need to ensure they already uh, have a good hygiene or not and something so forth i think like it is important to have that kind of shocks but when the situation has happened, when the shock is coming, I, I, I really uh, agree with what Angela mentioned about how we can like make the terms of One Health, it's more humanized. So yes. yeah, how we can 
bring one hug to our daily conversations, not only about uh, the researchers or maybe like the public health student or global health student just mentioned about the one health, but maybe we can put it in the supermarket or even make, uh, yes. we need to use that in the like traditional markets because I believe that it it's really useful like guidance, how we can aware about what we consume, especially, and how we aware how we like uh, manage our farms and et cetera. So yeah, I think we can use that. And yeah, about how we can more humanize the term of One Health, yeah. So you're suggesting that we have conversations or we have display signs and communication messages at retail points, um, health centers, um, educational um, 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 environments, um, across every single area of places that we commute and we also work and we also go to, is that what you're saying? Having conversations yes. there and having representations of what One Health has to has has an effect on for instance if people were to go to the supermarket what you're saying is that we should have signages on fruits and vegetables that show that possibly um pesticides and 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 things of that nature affect the food so therefore our action has a counter reaction is that what you're saying yes that's correct Okay, well, thank you very much, Pemas. I have two more questions for you. And um, one of the questions that I have is, what is an essential One Health skill, skill set that every citizen in your view should have? I think like uh, the one essential skills of One Health, uh, I think not only one, but like the main thing of the One Health itself is a partnerships. Yes. I think you need to have this, uh, that skills of partnership by sharing the information, give the access to multidisciplined, not only for our uh, sector only, but we need to go abroad. And the second one, a partnership to cre increase the awareness from our communities to our to other communities. And the last one, by having a partnership, creating a sustainable initiative to reduce the distance itself and also like create something to prevent, create a preventive actions, especially for IMR itself. Thank you, Prima. So I'm going to give you all the opportunity to give me your very last suggestions and your very last contributions, because this is all about action and you know putting things into, into proactive steps. So I'll come back to my very first speak, my very first panelist, Eleanor, to tell me what her two points, her two suggestions are towards making changes in this One Health dialogue and this conversation we're having. So Eleanor, to you, what are your two suggestions? What are your two takeaways? What are we, what are we walking away with from this conversation? What are your two solutions towards this conversation? Um, I think probably quite related to some of the things that um, other students have been putting in the chat and the other panellists have mentioned already. Um, I think collaboration and communication are absolutely essential um, for moving forward in terms of getting, um, getting the, the kind of different sectors to work together and understand the, the connections between them, particularly things like um, human veterinary and the environmental side of things and particularly with the um, increase in awareness uh, with climate change I think that gives us a really good opportunity to, to bring in one health aspects as we've talked about um, and I think the other thing that's important to sort of also try to bring in which we've not necessarily had time to talk about too much today is um, how one health and and those those ideas of collaboration and communication how those can also help to tackle um really quite significant global inequalities and um, so things that will affect obviously human health but even um you know animal welfare um particularly again in relation to to climate change how we're seeing that some countries have potentially contributed a lot more to certain issues but are not necessarily facing the consequences in the way that other countries and other places are so I think it's also important to try and even the ground a little bit and for some some countries and some industries and sectors to take a bit more responsibility and have a bit more accountability um, 
as, yeah, because their their actions and their policies have really are affecting people right now in some places where they're already extremely vulnerable. So I think that really does need to come into um, you know, with this kind of social and political aspects as well, because that's yeah, that's something that needs to be needs to be sort of addressed, I think, and can be included in, in the whole One Health debate, I think. Thank you very much for your contribution is collaboration and communication and one common voice. Now on to you, Angela. What are your two takeaways from this conversation? How would you, what what are your two suggestions that you'd like to give us as to how to make definite change about this conversation? Um, one, um, I'd like to suggest that we need to con contextualize one health in different regions. We need to accept that in as much we have in as much as we have our differences, it's our differences that actually unite us. It's our differences that actually uh, make us uh, come together and come up with a beautiful outcome. I'd give an example of the of how different countries handled the COVID-19 pandemic. This the way, yes, we had a common goal. But the way New Zealand handled the COVID-19 pandemic, the way Liberia handled the COVID-19 pandemic, the way India handled it, they were a bit different, but by the end of the day, they achieved the same goal. And we need to do the same thing in when it comes to One Health. We need to contextualize One Health in terms of language, in terms of culture, so that we don't just assume that just because uh, the UK, UK uh, understands One Health in this context, and this is how they're going to achieve the health outcomes is the same way Zimbabwe is going to understand one health in terms of the environment and their culture. And the other suggestion is that uh, we need to we need to ensure that young people carry the vision of one health because uh, it's easier to to mold a young mind than uh, a mind that has already matured. And if we we have young people carry this vision, it will be easier in the next five or eight or 10 years to actually actualize this uh, goal. This change. Yeah. Thank you, Angela. So Angela's contribution is contextualizing the subject and letting the youth carry the torch of change. Thank you so much, Angela. And coming to you, Zara, what are your two suggestions that you'd like us to take, take away from this conversation? Two solutions and two suggestions. I think um, quite similar to what Eleanor and Angela have already said, but a bespoke approach depending on the environment that you're in. For example, I know, I know in the UK we have things like, which are considered as champagne problems, like we discuss things like sugar and yes. cigarettes, whereas in other parts of the world, you know, people are trying to figure out how they're going to get the next meal on the table. Therefore, they don't have the same, I guess, tools. And like Eleanor said, getting on the same playing field and evening out that margin would be a great way forward. Additionally, I think for younger people, giving them the access to this information, if they want to like move forward with it I think they should know and ha know how to get there I think someone in the chat mentioned about um tvs or like internet is in urbanized areas and I think they're completely right I think not everyone is has the same privileges of having certain things like television to see arts to get that communication to get that information so having more seminars on radios or having more things in person i know it's in a covid world but social distance and taking the safety precautions like that but in a more accessible way to those communities i think that's also very very important thank you zara and, and i totally agree with you that having a mass communication campaign uh, around the subject 
that will permeate across all sectors, you know, from the entire wealth pyramid, from the informal sector all the way to the high income earners, is the way to kind of have this conversation because it in, in, in piecemeals and in pockets, it's kind of broken away and then people don't see the importance and it's lost in translation as well. So thank you so much for that suggestion. I totally agree with you. And last but not least, Pemata, what are your two solutions and takeaways um, that we could, our, our takeaways from this conversation? What would you suggest uh, we put into action steps from this, from this dialogue? Okay. Um, I think I really agree with all the panelists today, but maybe I would like to sum up about what as a youth, we can contribute because like, I believe like the takeaway for, from this, even like we need to engage the youth to help us uh, to connect the dots. Yes. For example, like if we create uh, educations and empowerment for youth, we can uh, suggest them to create a tailored solutions, a tailored um, initiative based on their countries or based on their communities. And we need to create a platform. So based on the tailored community, we can sharing each other what and, and learning from each other's about what we already get from the community and also like uh, create a mass impact what we already did. And one of them, I think uh, is through the One Health University Network, as far as I know is uh, available in the Southeast Asia. But if we can expand this kind of movement, not only for university students, but also came from like high school or even uh, a primary high school, it will be great. Yeah. Ladies, thank you so very much for your positive contributions and for giving us suggestions that are outside of, you know, the 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 rhetoric basically and thank you for giving us candid real-time suggestions and having one common voice and making a change once and for all i really appreciate your time once again a big thank you to eleanor raj all the way from the uk thank you for making the time for being with us here this morning again a big thank you to angela nambiro from kenya um zara emambukus from the uk as well and last but not the least permate mani imasi tonga all the way from indonesia thank you ladies for making the time for being with us this this morning and for your suggestions that we have taken note of to make change once and for all. Thank you. You're welcome. Now coming up next, we have a performance by a songwriter, a multi-instrumentalist, an arranger and a music producer. His name is Jovid Leonero and he's singing the song on AMR entitled I am responsible. Let's take a listen. Antibiotics have made our lives bad.
of a fine Antibiotics, we're still gonna need them, right? Cause too much of anything is bad You don't use it right, it becomes a threat Now that was a very catchy song by Jovis Leonero, all the way from um, the Philippines. He's a 29 year old singer and songwriter and a community pharmacist. Now that was definitely an approach to use to get people's attention and disseminate the information in a very catchy way with a very upbeat tune. So thank you very much Jovis Leonero for that song. Now the curtains of this event are drawing to an end, I'd like to first of all say a big thank you to all the participants that have come all the way from across the world, to all of our speakers, to every single one that contributed their their suggestions via your your your, your um, comments on the Zoom page. Thank you very much from Indonesia, from Kenya, from every part of the world, every single person that attended this event. I'm so grateful that she took the time to be here with us to so give us their closing remarks or his closing remarks. Please help me welcome Mr. Maximo Torero Kulen, who's the chief economist of the FAO. Now, he joined the organization in 2019 as an assistant director general for the Economic and Social Development Department. Prior to joining FAO, he was at the World Bank as an executive director for Argentina, for Bolivia, for Chile, for Paraguay, for Peru, for Uruguay. And since November 2016, he's, and before that with the bank, he's been at the Division for Markets and Trades and Institutions. And he has such a wealth of information when it comes to trade and the economy and the effects of One Health and how it affects everything else that we trade with. So please help me welcome Mr. Maximo Torero Kulen for his closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to all of you, future One Health Generation. And, and it was amazing to hear the, the discussions that you, you had started here. And, 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 and thank you very much for the inspirational discussions and creativity uh, and performances. Be beautiful music uh, that we have been seeing today, right now, and across the, the WFF, the World Food Forum. So engaging youth, leveraging creativity, and implementing innovation have long been FAO's priority to include in the global development narrative and increase ownership for younger generations to achieve the sustainable development goals. We truly believe that your involvement will help contribute to finding more sustainable and effective solutions as your ideas could drive social changes and generate positive outcomes. 
From today's event, there were several points that really captured my attention, and today's discussion helped us to understand the One Health future that you need and want. This is a strong message that I hope it could rely to a wider group of policymakers and development partners. As mentioned earlier, we are also looking forward to receiving your creative submissions through the One Health Youth Art Contest in the form of poetry, songs, and kid performances. We depend on your creativity to move people's hearts, enriching a healthy life for all, and translating this technical topic into accessible language. As the lead international organization implementing One Health are starting to ramp up One Health investment and activities, we will make sure to convey and take your ideas into account and keep momentum going. Moreover, your ideas and suggestions will be shared with youth leaders at the assembly happening in parallel now. There is just a meeting going on on the assembly with, with the independent chair, Hans. Uh, these are valuable insights that can relate to the compendium of actions being prepared by the youth at the World Food Forum and which will be presented at the end of the World Food Forum today. With the World Food Forum flagship event being symbolic kickoff of our youth engagements, we're optimistic that the World Food Forum will be a continuing movement that will inspire many more One Health Youth initiatives in the future. We encourage your continued interest in this topic as we need your passion and creative ideas to be the engine of the One Health future. And perhaps we might be able to meet as working partners in the future. I really hope so. And we really hope that we can work together. So thank you very much again. And it was a pleasure uh, to be here today with you all. Thank you very much, Mr. Maximo Toledo Pulen, and to all new students and participants from across the world. As you've heard from all of our speakers and our the head policymakers, this conversation is your conversation. Your, your contribution, your suggestions, your solutions, your ideas, your input is what we're waiting to hear from. So you are very much part of the conversation and everything lies in your hands. So your suggestions are welcome. Please do not forget that all your creative performances from skits to videos to music are open for submissions up until the 20th of October. So please feel free to register as much as you can and do not hesitate um, to, to put in an inquiry if you need to on, 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 you can go online on the One Health Future We Want at One Health at world-food-forum.org. The submissions are open for all entries from submissions from recordings for songs, skit performances, slam poetry, anything creative that you feel will make some kind of a change in this conversation. To all of you that have been here today from across the world, again, a big thank you to all of you for your time. And again, my name is Michelle Atto, all the way from Ghana. I'm a TV personality and a branding and marketing consultant. It's been such a pleasure to host this event for you and with you. And again, your contributions and suggestions are welcome. So thank you very much. So I see you again. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.